Ah, doors. We all know them. Who would have guessed that these things could be made scary? Well, development group L Splash certainly thought they could be, and it looks like they were right. Their game, Doors, has been going crazy over this past month. As of writing this very line, the game has 103,000 concurrent players. It's captured the attention of massive YouTube and Twitch personalities like DantyDM, Moist Critical, and XQC. Clearly, these guys know what they're doing. And so, I decided to jump in on this bandwagon and get some clout. Okay, that's not the real reason I'm making this video. I actually wanted to talk about the genius behind the design choices of this game. That seems deceptively simple, but actually holds layers upon layers of well thought out and super polished gameplay. Hello everyone, my name is Skit, and I'll be your room service for today. Make yourself at home, because we're going to be diving into the mostly great game design of Doors. Before we start, a quick rundown for anybody who may have came in late. If you know what Doors is already, feel free to skip to the timestamp on screen. If you don't, allow me to explain. Doors is a horror game where you go through a randomly generated array of rooms. Rooms have many different gimmicks, such as levers or locks. The real selling point though, are the game's entities. Monsters that could either be helpful, antagonistic, totally neutral, or jack. The game has a heavy focus on trial and error, which I'll cover in more detail later, but all you need to know is that each death is treated as a lesson, so you'll enter a lift, play for a bit, do something wrong, and die. The next time you play, you go on with a bit more knowledge than the last time. If you're watching this segment, I'm assuming you haven't played the game yet. There's a link in the description to the game, should you want to play it yourself. I'm going to spoil the mechanics of some of the entities in this video, so go play it now and come back later if you want the true, raw Doors experience. Alright, that's enough of that, let's really get into it. In case you're unaware, I make games as a hobby, so I have a very game design oriented perspective on a lot of the games I play. Because of this, I was really surprised at how well thought out the room was. To any regular player, the first level or portion of a game may just seem to be the easiest part. And while that's true, there's a bit more to it than just that. This is where developers have to teach the core mechanics of their game to the player. Sometimes this is done through a long and wordy tutorial dialogue, which is less than ideal. Doors, however, does a much better job than that. There's a lot more to unpack in this one room than meets the eye. When you first begin, the door opens to reveal a hotel lobby. Directly in front of you is a bell. Approach it and it'll prompt you with the interact key. Interact and you give it a nice, satisfying ding sound. This teaches the player that you can interact with things using the given key, which is E on a keyboard. Next, you'll find the door is locked. No biggie, just look around for a key. At this point, the player will probably notice the crouch prompt. This tells the player everything they need to know quick and easily. C is to crouch. They can then go under the cart, teaching the player that crouching makes your hitbox smaller, and eventually they'll be right next to the key. The player will interact with the key, teaching them about the interact button if they had missed everything around them previously, and then will be able to unlock the door. This first room teaches the player the basic mechanics of locks and keys, crouching, and interacting, all in a safe environment and in about 15 seconds. The entities, as previously mentioned, are this game's selling point. They all have their own unique behaviours, spawning conditions, and so on. I won't cover all of them, because I don't want to repeat myself too much, and I have to finish this video at some point, and some of them don't have a whole lot worth talking about. The ones I want to cover are Rush and Ambush, Seek, Halt, and the figure. I'll also briefly cover hide and guiding light because they're required for a bit of context. Hide is probably the least threatening hostile entity, unless you want to count Timothy. They don't ever make a visual appearance, rather they'll kick you out of a hiding place if you're in there for too long. Guiding Light is the one and only helpful entity in the game thus far. They aren't able to interact with the world at all, but will give you advice if you die and light the way to key parts of dark rooms, among other things. The last thing I want to do before we get to these guys is talk about telegraphing. If you're a game developer, you probably know what this is already, but if you're not, allow me to define it. Telegraphing just means communicating something to the player. This could be a visual cue, a sound, or both. Doors does a really, really good job of this, which you're going to see in a second. I'm going to talk about Rush and Ambush together, because they're very similar in behaviour. They have a chance of spawning in most rooms when you open the door. They telegraph their arrival by making the lights flash, and will also make a lot of noise as they approach, indicating that something is coming, and fast. 
In order to avoid them, you have to hide in a closet or under a bed or get far enough away from their paths. The two behave slightly differently though. Rush will break into the next room and disappear, while Ambush will reach the door to the next room and then go back the way they came. Ambush can do this between two and six times, meaning you have to get in and out of closets to avoid both Ambush and Hide kicking you out of the closet. The two are distinguishable by having slightly different screams, lights, and faces. Rush emits a dark blue light, has a grey face, and a much louder and raspier scream than Ambush. Ambush emits a bright green light, has a much brighter face, and a quieter, more smoothed out scream. These help the player to quickly pick up on which one of the two they're dealing with. I do have one problem with Rush in particular though. No one said, no, it's just don't hide in closets and beds, right? What the heck, when does he go back? In most cases, Rush will burst into the other room and then disappear, but on the off chance that Rush hits a dead end, he turns around and goes back. This isn't a problem if you're in the room with a dead end, because you'll be able to see it coming. If the next room is a dead end though, you won't be able to tell he's coming back until he actually does come back. This lack of telegraphing has killed me before, and while it's unlikely to happen and won't be an issue for most, it definitely feels like the game's fault when you do die to it. Ambush doesn't have this problem because Ambush always comes back. Is that a FNAF reference? No. I... <sighs> Anyways, because Ambush comes back every time, the player will be expecting it. If the player dies to Ambush coming back, they can learn from it, but they can't learn to predict a pseudo-randomly generated layout of rooms. That's not to say these two are super unfair. The developers made sure that they will only spawn if the room you just entered has somewhere to hide from them. This way it's not totally unfair on the player. They can't trigger an encounter with Ambush or Rush and literally have no way to survive it. Aside from my one gripe, these two are actually really well-made entities. Ah, Seek. Everyone's favorite tall, one-eyed figure to draw in... Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, what the fuck? Seek is a rather unique entity, as he chases you across multiple rooms in a super adrenaline-pumping action sequence. You'll encounter him twice in a full run, and you'll be warned of Seek approaching thanks to the many eyes that appear the closer and closer you get to the hall where he shows up. The lights also flash a bit, making it easy to mistake it as Rush or Ambush coming, but thanks to the presence of the eyes, this isn't really an issue. When you actually get to the hall Seek is in, a short cutscene will play, alerting you to his presence before the chase ensues. Make too many wrong turns and Seek catches up to you, killing you instantly. Make the right turns and you'll eventually reach a room where the door closes behind you, stopping Seek from getting any further. This portion of the game makes use of guiding light, illuminating the path so players can quickly figure out where to go. The developers could have easily left this up to the player, but that would have made the chase way more frustrating than it would have been challenging. Something that is frustrating though, at least for some, is the auto run. The game will automatically make you run forward, which kinda makes sense, but a lot of players would rather be holding down the key themselves, which is totally fair. This is where Doors starts to lack a bit. It's not all that accessible, and while some accessibility features not being there does make sense, such as not being able to just disable sound effects, there are things like disabling auto run that have no reason not to be there. There are absolutely no settings in this game other than the default Roblox ones, but in all fairness, the game is still in alpha, so this could be something they have on their to-do list that they're saving for later. The last thing about Seek that I want to talk about is the music. Music is very important in setting the mood for games, and the composer absolutely knocked it out of the park with Seek's chase theme, Here I Come. The music really gets the adrenaline pumping. The music also has a bit of telegraphing, as it'll jump to the final, slow chord at the end of the song once you're safe from seat, so the player knows that they don't have to keep running. Holt is probably my favourite entity in the game. Its behaviour is incredibly unique, but easy enough to wrap your head around. Holt telegraphs his presence by making the lights flash, similarly to Rush or Ambush. However, the lights will flash for much longer if Holt is nearby, so it's not hard to distinguish which entity you're dealing with. You don't encounter Holt until you enter the next room, or try to enter the next room I should say. Holt will actually teleport you to its own super long and dark hallway, and begins to hunt you down. Holt chases the player for a bit, but will randomly teleport its 
itself in front of the player, forcing them to turn around and run the other way. This process will repeat until you reach the end of the room. Holt's telegraphing is very on the nose. Static flashes on your screen, literally telling you exactly what you need to do. It'll say turn around if Holt just teleported ahead of you, or run away if Holt is getting too close. It's very brief, blink and you'll miss it, but if you know what you're looking for, you'll pick up on these cues when they appear. There's also a bit of audio to go with them, so if you do blink and miss it, you'll still be able to hear it. Holt also has a couple more tricks up its sleeve. Halfway down the hall is a door frame lacking a door. To help the player feel like they aren't stuck in some endless loop and that they're actually making progress. Along with this, the developers were wise enough to make Holt teleport ahead of you quicker if you're walking away from the exit and let you walk for longer if you're going towards it. Holt isn't very liked by speedrunners though. It does take a lot of time to get past. Its haul is really long, but for casual players, Holt is a great albeit a bit rare, encounter. Finally, the figure. In a similar fashion to Seek, the figure only appears twice ever in the game. However, unlike Seek, the figure appears in the exact same rooms every run. Room 50 the first time, and rooms 99 and 100 the second. The figure is entirely blind, and relies on sound to find players. He's also super fast. This makes for some super fun gameplay where players have to stay out of his way while he roams the rooms. If the player is in a closet, the figure may choose to inspect it. This will trigger a mini game where the player has to time their button presses with the heartbeat. Do it right, and the figure will leave. Do it wrong, and the figure will rip you out of your hiding spot and eat your face off. The developers were nice enough to remove hide from the floors figure appears in, so you don't have to worry about that. The player's objective varies depending on the room they're in. In the case of room 50, the player needs to find the combination for a lock while remaining undetected. The room is very open, which perfectly fits the figure. There's plenty of room for the player to use to avoid him. Keep that in mind, we'll come back to that later. The devs also took advantage of the wide open space by making the process of finding the combination for the lock, a bit of a scavenger hunt. Certain books can be taken off the shelves and contain a number and a shape. Each shape refers to a digit on the combo lock, but not every single shape is needed. Books will make a nice shining sound effect when you're nearby, and stick out from the bookshelves ever so slightly, telegraphing to the player that the book can be taken off the shelf. There's also a bit of paper on a disc the player needs to get that'll tell them the order of the shapes on the lock. This is lit up by the guiding light, because it blends into its environment without it. Once all five digits are found, the player can escape using the code. This room does a great job of utilizing the figure's behavior in a way that's fun and suspenseful. That being said, there is another room that doesn't do nearly as good a job. Unlike room 50, rooms 99 and rooms 100 are very, very small. In order to avoid the figure, you hide in one of the closets, play the heartbeat minigame, and wait for it to leave into the next room. Once that's happened, the figure is locked out of the room. You're completely safe. This really kills the suspense the game had going beforehand. The opening is really promising, but once the only threat is gone, you're pretty much home free. There is still a little bit of good design here though. After this, you have to go up to the stairs to retrieve a key from the elevator. The player now knows where the elevator is, which will be important later. This key allows the player to enter the power room and turn on the power for the elevator. After this, the figure breaks down the door and becomes a threat again. The only problem is, it's really easy to outrun here for some reason. Once you reach the elevator, you're safe. That's it. You win. These two rooms are the one major gripe I have with the game. The figure is basically this game's boss fight, and a boss fight should challenge the skills the player has learned or expand upon the mechanics of the game somehow. The heartbeat minigame kind of does this, as does the puzzle to the elevator's power, but that's it. The figure works best in open spaces, and it seems the developers knew this because they just lock him out. He isn't even present for half of this room. The dev should have designed the segment around the figure more, and made him more of a threat, to really test the stuff the player has been learning. Unfortunately, that's not what we got. At least the ending cutscene is cool. There are a few other things I want to talk about that I think the game does really well. Letting you interact with things like paintings and typewriters is a great way of bringing more life into the game. It might be pointless, but who cares, it's fun! I didn't see a single YouTuber who didn't pretend to be typing on the typewriter when they first saw it. Great call from the devs. Secondly, I want to mention the glitch. The glitch is another entity in the game who isn't 
technically can into the lore of the game. It serves as a way of keeping players from being left behind and recovering from room generation errors. If you're in a room when it unloads because someone you're playing with has gone too far ahead, you'll run into the glitch and be teleported into the next room over. You'll also take a bit of damage. If it's a generation glitch, the game will just teleport everyone into a new room and be on its merry way. No damage for that one, because it's not the player's fault. To help players avoid encountering the glitch from being left behind, the devs also make your character run faster the further back you are. Lastly, the game allows you to buy revives. To keep it from being paid to win, you're only allowed to revive once in a run and not at the very end. I also noticed that if you buy a revive, you actually keep it a bit before it's consumed. According to the wiki, this is about 15 seconds. If you die, you'll keep this revive, but still won't be able to revive that round. That's really nice of you devs. Overall, despite its flaws, Doors is a very polished game. The developers clearly know what they're doing, and I look forward to seeing where the game goes next. If you watched this far, I take it you enjoyed the video. Feel free to leave a like, or maybe even subscribe. I'm working on an update for my own horror game right now, so if you want to see that, make sure you've got notifications on. That's all from me, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.